Christy Michael from Long Long Honeymoon, also known as Loloho. Today we're talking about a topic that is very important for your enjoyment of RV camping, and that is boondocking and or camping without hookups. What do I mean by boondocking? Well, if you look at any RV marketing materials, you'll see an example of boondocking usually because it's really what the industry promotes as the ideal standard for RV camping. Usually, if you pick up any glossy RV camping brochure, you'll see one RV out in the wilderness somewhere by itself in a pristine natural environment with no hookups. You know, there'll be no electrical, water, or sewer hookups. And for many of us, that represents the dream of RV camping. Now, quite often, the reality of RV camping might be that you're in a campground somewhere and you got a neighbor on one side and a neighbor on the other side about 10 feet from you mm -hmm. and uh, you're locked into those hookups and it of, might look a little bit more like a parking lot than you know the national park <laughs> it is incredibly liberating to pull your rig off anywhere you want and uh, you know have all the comforts of home wherever you want yeah like that to me is kind of what RV camping is all about. And we don't do it every night. We don't do it all the time when we travel. We love hookups too. <laughs> but, you know, traveling to Alaska, there are times in Alaska and in the Yukon Territory and in British Columbia. Where there wasn't a campground. There wasn't a campground. You so You pulled over on the side of the road, you know, in a pullout, and that was your campsite for the night. And that's just the way it is in some places, you know. The more remote you get, the fewer options you have. And for some reason, a lot of those boondocking sites are seared into my brain. Like, I can specifically remember all sorts of details about those places. Some of them were the more, most gorgeous campsites we've ever stayed in. I mean, even though it was on the side of the road, you open your door and you have just this insane view, you know, of nature, and you're the only person out there, so. One, for example, that I remember is we were traveling from Haynes Junction, Yukon to Haynes, Alaska, and the road is absolutely gorgeous like it's it's such an anomaly up there especially because a lot of the roads are in pretty rough condition and there was this beautifully paved highway and we pulled off on the side of the highway in this just little turnout and the autumn colors were just amazing like probably some of the most just striking you know autumn beauty that I'd ever seen anywhere and it was just us there was like no one within, I don't know how many miles. A hundred miles probably. <laughs> just us and the grizzly bears. Yeah. I just remembered these specific boondocking sites. And I think because they're all different and because it's such a unique experience every time you stop and, and boondock in nature that you're, you're getting a little bit more out of it as opposed to being in a claustrophobic campground environment plugged into all your hookups and watching TV or something. You know what I mean? Right. Like now again, we love we our hookups. We do that too. But from time to time if you're going to get the most out of your RV travel experience, you need to be willing to go off the beaten path a little bit and experience nature. So that's why when I say we're talking about boondocking and camping without hookups, uh, they're similar but different. Uh, boondocking is usually free and it's usually parking your rig just somewhere out there. Now we sometimes refer to boondocking in Walmart parking lots when we're traveling around the country. Don't do that because people will be like, oh that's not boondocking. Uh -huh. ah. But it really is a form of boondocking because you're parking, you're overnight parking without any kind of hookups. And you're self-sufficient so to me that's what defines boondocking. So I know there's some of you out there who, who are saying, we don't really foresee ourselves doing much boondocking. Well, you may find yourselves in situations in national parks where, where you, you don't are, have a choice. <laughs> right. I mean, you, if you want to stay in the national park, you're going to have to boondock a or lot of times dry camp. National parks, it means camping without hookups. For example, in our favorite campground in the Grand Tetons, which is Grovant, there are no hookups. So really, if you want to use your RV to its fullest extent, 
you're gonna end up doing some boondocking and or camping without hookups sooner or later. The average American couple uses something like 180 gallons of fresh water every day. We have 54 gallons total in our Airstream. So if we lived like the average American couple when we were out there boondocking, we would be bone dry uh, by noon. We'd, we'd be out of water and life would be miserable. You know, when you, when you run out of fresh water, life quickly becomes intolerable. Yeah. You really do have to think about your water usage. And it's funny because in America, we're very spoiled um, with being able to turn on a tap and there be fresh, clean water to use for whatever you want to do. But in a camper, you know, you, you really are mindful of every time you turn on the tap. I've often said that RV camping is an exercise in water management because when we're traveling around the country with our Airstream, we're constantly keeping in mind how much fresh water we've got and what the storage capacity is of our gray and black water tanks. So let's think quickly about what we use water for when we're traveling with our Airstream. There is cooking, mm -hmm. drinking obviously, mm -hmm. cleaning and or washing, showering, mm -hmm. and flushing. Okay, of all of those purposes of water, I don't think cooking is severely affected. No, you know, I mean, in. I don't use tons of water when I cook. I mean, I might boil something every now and then, but you know, it's a minute amount. Not a big factor. Mm -mm. Flushing isn't affected. No, because if you're just two people, I mean, it's gonna take you a while to fill up a black tank. Drinking, is not really affected because if you're thirsty, you're going to drink water. Now, I should explain how we handle our fresh water uh, drinking supply when we're traveling. We do drink the water from our Airstream's water tank. We filter it twice. The water is filtered outside with one of those big industrial size camping filters that claims to last an entire season. So that water is filtered before it ever even enters our Airstream holding tank. Then we filter it a second time with a little water pitcher, water pitcher that has a built-in water filter. Just a Brita water pitcher. We found the smallest possible uh, water pitcher that would just barely fit inside yeah, our Airstream. Yeah, we have to like turn it a certain way for it to fit in our fridge, but they do make one that will fit. So What's left? What do we really have to focus on? It's washing and showering. We're going to talk about some techniques that we've learned to stretch out our water as long as possible. We've gone as long as nine or nine days, maybe 10. Nine days for sure, maybe 10. Off the 54 gallon freshwater tank. Now the real capacities to keep in mind are not just the freshwater capacity because you can refill your freshwater tank as you go if you carry around a jerry can of fresh water, which I recommend that you do. But you've got to keep in mind your black water and gray water holding capacities because once those are full, it's game over. you got to go find a dump station somewhere. Mm -hmm. And if you're set up boondocking and you've unhitched your Airstream and you know, you're know you in a nice campsite and you don't want to have to pack up and move to a dump station, then you want to stretch out your capacities of uh, black and gray as long as you can. Mm -hmm. So one of the little products that we found that helps us when we're boondocking is called dry shampoo. Now, I'd never heard of dry shampoo before. I had no idea what it was, but uh, this is something that Chrissy discovered. I mean, dry shampoo is basically a way to refresh your hair without washing it. So all the ladies I'm sure know what I'm talking about. Men are probably like, what? But it's basically an aerosol can that um, distributes a type of powder and you basically spray it on your roots. You kind of do your hair like this and let it sit for a few minutes and then you just comb it out. You know, it's super easy. Basically what it does is it absorbs the oil on your scalp and in your hair and I mean you can do it maybe twice before you need to actually wash your hair. hair you know? It's interesting stuff. Like. I don't use it every day because I usually have short hair when we're traveling around in the summer. Anyway. Guys don't have a problem doing a quick wash of hair, but you know, when you have long hair, just rinsing the shampoo out of your hair sucks a lot of water. So in addition to dry shampoo. Well, there's the Navy shower technique. Um, 
showering your body, if you do it right in a, sh in a shower, you can do it in like two gallons of water. You basically turn on the shower, spray yourself off, get wet, turn the shower back off, soap up, and then turn it back on to rinse yourself. So you can shower your body really quickly with a minute amount of water. Something else that we use that really makes a difference is we have an Oxygenix shower head. I highly, highly, highly recommend this. It has transformed our camping experience tremendously. It's a small shower head. Basically what it does is it combines oxygen with the water. It increases your, your pr water pressure substantially. So even if you don't need it for water conservation methods, it's worth it just because of the water pressure increase. But it also uses less water. So you can take a little bit longer shower with the same amount of water that you were using on a shorter shower. So I highly recommend that. Yeah, we'll include a link on the page wherever this video happens to be playing uh, that'll link you to the appropriate shower head if you're so interested. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to washing hands, we still wash our hands, of course. Yes. Um, but you just, you don't turn on the water and let Leave it run. It running. Everything happens really quickly. And I will say, you know, nowadays we have hand sanitizers and that sort of thing that you can use. Right. You supplement hand washing and sometimes substitute hand washing with hand sanitizer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really helps stretch out your water supply. As far as the, the washing goes with dishes and that sort of thing, it really depends on where you're camping. Some campgrounds will have a dishwashing station at a bathhouse that you can take your dishes there and wash them. If they do, I highly recommend doing that. Um, it'll just make things easier. Um, and the other thing that I do when we're dry camping, and a lot of people will hate me for this, is I use paper plates. Sorry, I do it. Uh, it's paper plate versus water. You know, it's just one of those things. Hey, um, they're recyclable. <laughs> they are recyclable. And a lot of campgrounds have recycling um, centers where you can toss your paper and, you know, that sort of thing. So it just saves me from having to wash plates, whereas I will just wash the pans that I use to cook. So that makes a big difference. The other thing that I do is if there's not a place where I can take my dishes to wash them at the campground is I make sure I wipe the pots and pans out really good with a paper towel to get any sort of food residue that will just wipe off with a paper towel off as much as I can before I wash. Sometimes if um, the situation is grim, I will even um, scoop out the dirty water in the sink with a big mixing bowl and pour it out in the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> a couple gallons here and there really can make a difference you know, going in the black tank versus the gray tank. I will say that we Americans are pretty uptight about the disposal of gray water. I mean, we have yeah. never emptied gray water anywhere except a designated dump station, but gray water is basically just soapy water. We've RV camped in other countries like Argentina, and they were like, ah, just empty the gray water anywhere you want. Like and it's not a big deal. We can't really do that. So, you know, that sort of brings me to another point. When we're traveling around the country, boondocking in different places, how do we find dump stations and how do we find fresh water? Well, there are a number of different website resources that you can use. There's one that I would sort of recommend and that's <laughs> sandydumps.com. And the reason I sort of recommend it is it's not really updated as frequently as it should be. And at times we've hit some dead ends when we follow those leads, but you know, you could, say be traveling around and you're in the middle of Kansas somewhere mm -hmm. you go to this website you can look up and and look up the town where you happen to be and if there is a dump station in the vicinity then uh, it'll point you in that direction now we've had some pretty good luck at casinos mm -hmm. truck stops mm -hmm. gas stations and sometimes outdoor stores like uh, Cabela's, Cabela's. sometimes. Sometimes Camping World will have one, which I'm sorry, your Camping World, you should have a dump station. That's just my thought. <laughs> yeah, they should have them on in that. every Camping World. But. <laughs> you want to bring the customers in, put in a dump station. I mean, it just makes sense. But anyhow, Marcus Lamonis, are you listening? <laughs> you need to be listening to that. But you know, it's one of those things where if you look hard enough, you'll find one. A lot of states, our home state of Alabama does this. Most 
um, rest stops have a dump station where you can empty your tanks. Not all of them have fresh water where you can refill them, but you know, a lot of times it's easier to find fresh water than it is to find a dump station. So another resource that we use occasionally is a book called The Next Exit. And that book basically tells you what's at every exit on every major interstate across the country. And it will tell you if there's a dump station at an exit. So you can sort of look at the interstate that you're traveling on, you know, eastbound, westbound, north, south, and you can sort of look down the row there and see, you know, in the next 50 miles, is there gonna be a dump station? So that's kind of useful as well. So what you'll have to do if you're out there living this lifestyle is get on the internet a bit, do a little research, and you get into this sort of groove because we can usually stretch out our water supply for several days. And when it looks like we're going to need a dump station, you just start looking at the map and you'll figure it out. And then the other thing, of course, every once in a while, even when we're out there boondocking, we'll stop uh, at a full hookup campground for one night somewhere. And it's a good opportunity to kind of recharge, refresh, Pretty much any opportunity you have to empty your tanks and fill up your freshwater tank. Take it. We try to take it. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you never know when the next opportunity will be. It's like when you're a kid and you say you don't have to go to the bathroom and your mom says, try, go anyway. Same thing. Exactly. Any chance you get <laughs> and any chance we get to top off our freshwater, I'm usually doing it. Um, the only thing I would say you have to consider is water adds a lot of weight. To your trailer mm -hmm. so you're constantly sort of playing this mathematical game well do we want to tow around that much water <laughs> so um that's i guess a quick primer and how we handle water when we're boondocking and or camping without hookups mm -hmm. um, i hope you found it helpful and maybe gotten a few new ideas i'm sure a lot of you grizzled veteran RV campers out there knew a lot of this stuff anyway. And you probably have tips for us. So if you have any great tips that you, you know, have to share with us, we'd love to hear what you do to stretch out your water supply. That's kind of what it's all about. We really appreciate the flow of information back and forth. We've really enjoyed hearing from you on Facebook and YouTube and our website and all the other <laughs> places where we put information out there. Yep. As always, if you liked this video, give it a thumbs up. If you disliked it, give it a thumbs down. Or just keep that to yourself. <laughs> and uh, leave a comment, we'll check them out. And if you haven't already, subscribe. You know, get engaged, say hello, introduce yourself. And stay tuned for the next episode of the Loloho Show. Loloho! If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. If you disliked it, give it a thumbs down. Feel free to leave a comment. And of course, don't forget to subscribe.